uh, for our panel this afternoon on uh, the False Claims Act one year after uh, the Supreme Court's decision in Escobar. Um, I'm Chris Manning. I'm a partner at Williams and Connolly. I'm a co-chair of the KETAM subcommittee of the Criminal Justice Section. And uh, thank you for your time today. Um, we have a great panel here today. Uh, I'm joined by um, Tom McConville, who's a partner at Oric uh, in Los Angeles. Tom's practice focuses on uh, representing companies that are uh, involved in uh, some uh, issues with the federal government, including False Claims Act uh, litigation. He's represented healthcare providers and defense contractors in False Claims Act matters. And prior to working at Oric, he spent 10 years working as an assistant U.S. attorney uh, in both California and Ohio. Um, and Tom's received a number of honors, including being named California Lawyer of the Year for litigation by the California Lawyer Magazine. Um, I'm also joined by Rich Hayes. Uh, Rich is the um, Deputy Chief of the Civil Division of the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office uh, in the Eastern District of New York, and he supervises the office's uh, False Claims Act matters, civil fraud practice areas, and he also oversees the office's environmental practice uh, on the civil side, and he's overseen investigations involving uh, mortgage, residential mortgage-backed securities issues uh, under FERIA, uh, civil RICO issues, um, as well as controlled, substance at, controlled Substances Act cases. Uh, and Rich is a two-time recipient of the Attorney General's Award for Distinguished Service uh, and a two-time recipient of the Director's Award for Superior Performance um, from the Executive Office of U.S. Attorneys. Um, Rob Vogel uh, is a partner with Vogel, Slade, and Goldstein in Washington, D.C. Rob focuses on representing relators, uh, plaintiffs in uh, key TAM cases involving the health care industry, defense uh, contracting, and other uh, types of False Claims Act matters. Uh, Rob's represented uh, more than 90 plaintiffs in civil key TAM matters that have resulted in more than a billion dollars of recoveries uh, for the U.S. Treasury. And before going into private practice, uh, Rob was a trial attorney in the commercial fraud section of the Department of Justice. Um, and since 2008, he's also served as a co-chair of the Procurement Fraud Committee of the uh, ABA's Public Contract Law section. So thanks to the three of you for joining us. So we'll get started. I know a lot of you are here because you know something about the False Claims Act, but some of you may not be as familiar with it. So we wanted to start with some background about the False Claims Act. Um, it's a statute that provides both for civil and criminal liability uh, for false claims made uh, for money or property from the U.S. government. Uh, the elements under uh, the civil statute involve um, knowingly presenting false claims, knowingly making false statements, uh, revert what, what are called reverse false claims, trying to keep uh, money or property that you've gotten from the, from the government, as well as conspiracy uh, claims under the False Claims Act. Uh, there is a criminal statute and there are anti-retaliation provisions that protect individuals who are um, raising concerns, complaints within companies uh, or to the government about False Claims Act issues. Uh, the False Claims Act started as a Civil War era statute when the Union Army was finding that it was dealing with some unscrupulous defense contractors who were selling them uh, guns that wouldn't shoot, ships that uh, had rotten hulls, um, ran uh, rancid rations. Uh, there's a case about the same mule being sold to the Army over and over again. Um, and there was no redress at the time under existing federal law to go after the uh, uh, the fraudsters. So uh, President Lincoln had petitioned Congress for a statute that would al allow uh, the federal government to go after uh, the defense contractors who were engaging in those kinds of activities. And so the False Claims Act became known as Lincoln's Law. Uh, one of the most important aspects of the False Claims Act are the key TAM provisions. And the phrase key TAM comes from a much longer Latin phrase uh, that talks about someone who's bringing a lawsuit for the king as well as themselves. And it means that a private citizen or a relator uh, can bring claims on behalf of the United States. The government gets to see the complaint under seal and make an initial determination whether to intervene in the case or to decline to intervene, in which case the relator can proceed with the case on their own. Uh, or in some cases, the government can choose to dismiss the case if they don't want the relator to proceed and they don't want to intervene. Uh, the private relator can then get a share of any recovery that the government gets 
uh, for the lawsuit. Uh, and it, the percentage of the share will change depending on whether the government intervenes and takes over the case or whether the government declines to intervene uh, and the relator has to go on their own. And False Claims Act litigation has led to some very high stakes cases and some big incentives for both the government and private relators to go forward with cases. Um, it provides for treble damages, uh, three times the amount of uh, the damages, uh, and civil penalties. So every, every false claim has a statutory penalty uh, that now under current law has increased to between a little over $10,000 to a little over $21,000 per claim. So if you're talking about certain industries where you're making thousands and thousands of claims, if those are all part of a lawsuit, just the penalties alone can add up to millions of dollars. In it, and that's before you get into any damages that are going to be trebled uh, under the statute. Uh, the False Claims Act also provides for statutory attorney's fees and costs. And it's led to, uh, the cases have led to a lot of long, uh, protracted discovery, uh, very expensive cases for uh, government, for relators, and for uh, the companies uh, to defend. And in one recent decision, uh, the D.C. Circuit, they spelled that out. They said that the case had been pending for 12 years. Um, there had been three years of discovery. This was all prior to motion, uh, motion for summary judgment. A million documents in the case, and so that 12 years of litigation had led to very, very expensive discovery in a case that was ultimately dismissed uh, at the summary judgment stage. Um, the top 100 recoveries in False Claims Act litigation um, have ranged from between $100 million of recovery to over $2 billion of recovery, with the median relator share uh, across all cases being over $100,000. And since the uh, False Claims Act was uh, amended in 1987, there's been a, a massive expansion uh, in both litigation and in the amounts at issue in these cases. So in 1987, which was the first year that the Department of Justice started compiling statistics, um, there was $86 million of recovery. Um, in fiscal year 2014, that had increased to $6.1 billion. Um, there's also been a shift in the number of cases being filed by relators. So in 1987, um, 30 cases out of the 373 new cases filed that year were, were brought by private relators as opposed to the government. Uh, but in fiscal year 2016, that had increased to uh, 702 out of the 845 new cases being filed just by private relators. There's also been a significant shift over time. So since 1987, when the focus was really on defense contracting, um, it over the, t over the years has now become principally focused on health care. Uh, there, there were 15 health care cases filed in 1987 under the False Claims Act, uh, 570 uh, last year. And in the as, as opposed to the defense industry, where there were 257 cases, filed in 1987 and only 39 last year. Uh, there's also been an expansion in the industries that have uh, been the subject of False Claims Act litigation. So now you're seeing False Claims Act cases being brought in financial services industries, uh, in the educational sector, in telecommunications, and in the tech sector as well. And in advertising, because uh, of Lance Armstrong. <laughs> right, <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. And there's also been an evolution in the theories of liability. So instead of just looking at express false statements, um, you know, here's a gun, you know, it's supposed to shoot, there now are uh, reverse false claims, as we talked about earlier, uh, fraudulent inducement theories of liability that the government was induced to enter into a contract uh, based on false premises, and then also what's been known as the implied false certification theory of liability, which was the subject of the Supreme Court's decision in Escobar. The implied false certification theory really deals with the idea of fraud by omission uh, with an emphasis in a lot of the cases on legal falsity. Uh, so alleged failures to disclose breaches of statutory or regulatory violations um, of contract, you know, provisions of contracts. And that's led to questions of materiality and scope. Um, so there have been cases in which uh, a, a munitions provider was sued uh, for allegedly having uh, violations of environmental or OSHA laws. The, the, the explosives they were making uh, worked, 
uh, but they were violating uh, regulations allegedly that had you know nothing to do with whether the munitions worked. They had to do with other more tangential regulatory matters. Uh, the hypothetical that came up in the Escobar case was the idea of a Medicare provider uh, using a foreign stapler if uh, they had signed a contract that said they would abide by all regulations, uh, including regulations to buy American staplers, would that somehow transform every claim made with a claim that was stapled using a foreign stapler into a false claim? Uh, and it raised the question in a lot of people's minds about whether uh, really we were dealing with breach of contract cases that were being transformed into fraud cases under the False Claims Act. So over time, a circuit split developed uh, as to the viability and the limits of the implied false certification theory. And that came to a head in the Supreme Court's decision in Escobar. Um, the Escobar case uh, dealt with some pretty tragic circumstances. There was a young woman uh, in Massachusetts who was having behavioral uh, issues and sought treatment at an outpatient mental health clinic in Massachusetts. And she was treated by a number of medical professionals there. Um, and in 2009, she had an adverse reaction to medication that she had been prescribed by one of the practitioners there. Um, and her condition worsened. She had a seizure and ultimately died. Um, and her parents uh, learned later from some people they were speaking with that uh, a number of the practitioners at the clinic were not actually licensed by the state of Massachusetts uh, to provide mental health services or to prescribe medicine. Um, and so they brought a claim under the False Claims Act um, relating to the, uh, the failure to have licensed practitioners there, uh, the fact that there was a lack of supervision in their, in their view of the people who were in fact providing services. And because uh, the claims that they were submitting were under Medicaid, they felt that there was a basis under the False Claims Act uh, to pursue the clinic. Um, and their theory was that the clinic was alleging every time it was submitting a Medicaid claim that it was in compliance with all Medicaid regulations, including regulations that would require them to have licensed practitioners. The district court, um, on a motion to dismiss, uh, decided to dismiss the complaint. And its view was that the provisions at issue that they were, uh, the parents were suing under uh, were not express conditions of payment. And if they weren't express conditions of payment, they shouldn't support a False Claims Act claim. Uh, but the First Circuit reversed in part, um, and they felt that the express condition of payment standard was uh, too high of a threshold, and they felt that materiality would be satisfied if the government would be entitled to refuse uh, payment if it knew of the alleged violation. Um, the Supreme Court ultimately granted cert. Uh, there was a circuit split on some of the issues. Um, and there were two principal issues on appeal. The first was whether this implied false certification theory was even viable to begin with. So that was uh, a circuit split between the First Circuit, which said it was, uh, and the Seventh Circuit, which in a case called Sanford Brown, um, had held that only express false statements uh, could be viable. Um, and then the second issue was if, if the theory was viable, um, would the provision at issue have to be an express condition of payment to support a False Claims Act claim? Uh, and the Second Circuit, in a case called Mike's v. Strauss, had held that it needed to be, uh, the provision needed to be an express condition of payment. Uh, the First Circuit had just held that it did not need to be. So uh, during oral argument, it was clear that the justices were very concerned with um, making sure there was a vehicle to pursue um, troubling cases of alleged fraud, but also putting some reasonable limits uh, on the scope of the claim. And so, you know, there were comments by the justices of making sure that um, uh, contractors weren't going to be held accountable for having generally certified compliance with every one of 40,000 regulations uh, that might come down to the stapler or the size of a table that you use for, you know, purposes of your business. Uh, but at the same time, other justices had expressed concern about in, um, construing the statute too narrowly and allowing uh, real frauds to go unpunished. Ultimately, um, the court issued a unanimous opinion. Um, and Justice Thomas authored it. Um, the court held that implied false certification would be OK and would support a False Claims Act claim. Uh, at least in some circumstances. So 
uh, the opinion talks about at least where two conditions are satisfied. First, where the claim doesn't merely request payment, but also makes specific representations about the goods or services being provided. And second, the defendant's failure to disclose the noncompliance with material uh, requirements makes those representations, the ones about the product or service, misleading half-truths. And what the court found uh, to be a material fact here was that the clinic had submitted billing codes as part of its Medicaid claims, and the billing codes were billing codes that were associated with having licensed practitioners. So the fact that the people who had performed the services were not, in fact, licensed meant that the use of those codes uh, was a misleading half-truth in the court's view and would support uh, a False Claims Act claim. The court also held that there, would, there was no express condition of payment requirement, so it overruled the Second Circuit's decision uh, in Mike's v. Strauss. But it did say that, the court did say that the misrepresentation has to be material to the payment decision. Um, just as Thomas wrote, the False Claims Act is not an all-purpose anti-fraud statute. It, it's not a vehicle to punish garden variety breaches of contract or regulatory violations. And it really importantly, especially for defense practitioners like Tom, um, you know, the court rejected the idea that materiality is too fact-intensive to decide at a motion to dismiss or a summary judgment stage. Um, so really uh, opening the door for, um, for motions, preliminary motions, to try to knock out implied false certification theories on materiality grounds. The court also gave examples of evidence that um, courts could deem to be um, material, um, evidence of materiality. Um, whether a provision is labeled as an express condition of payment um, would be relevant, but the court said that would not be alone dispositive. Uh, a lot of government contracts do say they do have a catch-all provision that says you're going to, you know, you certify that you're in compliance with every applicable regulation. Um, and so the court said that may be relevant, but it's not going to be dispositive. Um, the court held it's not enough to show that the government would simply be entitled to refuse payment based on the violation. Uh, but materiality can be established by showing that the government consistently refuses to pay in what the court called the mine run of cases uh, based on noncompliance with the requirement at issue. And one of the key questions that the court identified is what has the government done after having actual knowledge of the alleged violations either in the case at issue or in similar cases. And the court acknowledged that government knowledge uh, could be evidence that would rebut materiality. So if the government has paid a particular claim in full, despite actual knowledge that certain requirements were violated, that would be, in the court's view, very strong evidence that those requirements are not material. But it, and at the same time, if the government regularly pays a particular type of claim, not the one at issue, but in other similar situations, despite actual knowledge that certain requirements are not being complied with, uh, that's strong evidence uh, that the requirements are not material. And since Escobar, a lot of courts have considered uh, cases uh, coming up on appeal at the motion to dismiss and the summary judgment stages, and we'll talk about some of those here today. Uh, but in a number of cases, the ones that we've indicated with an asterisk here, the court uh, did affirm a dismissal of either a motion to dismiss or a motion for summary judgment based at least in part on materiality. Courts have also affirmed on other grounds, including an absence of specific representations about the product or service um, or a failure to plead knowledge, which is one of the elements uh, under the False Claims Act or falsity uh, sufficiently or a failure to meet Rule 9b, but at least in some cases uh, materiality has been enough uh, for the courts to affirm the dismissal. Uh, these three cases, McBride, Petratos, and Abbott, are the three that affirmed only on materiality. So those are cases where the court really focused only on materiality, did not look at those other uh, issues identified above. And courts are looking to government knowledge. They're looking to what the government did after it had knowledge of the allegations or the alleged noncompliance. Um, and that includes uh, the McBride case in D.C., the D'Agostino case in the First Circuit, Sanford Brown, uh, which was reconsidered uh, after the Supreme Court's decision in Escobar, uh, and the Abbott case in the Fifth Circuit. But 
some courts have found that government knowledge is not necessarily dispositive uh, and allowed cases to proceed. So Escobar on remand, uh, one of the issues there was the, the idea that the, uh, that the authorities were aware of the fact that some of these uh, practitioners were not licensed um, and held on remand that mere awareness of the allegation is not actual knowledge of the violation, so drawing a distinction there. Uh, and then recently, uh, last month in the Campy case, the Ninth Circuit held that uh, in a case involving HIV drugs that uh, were allegedly misbranded and um, there have been false statements made about them. Uh, to read much too much into the FDA's continued approval would be a mistake. So let's open it up to the panel here for some questions. You know, after Escobar, um, what does what what does materiality mean given uh, what the court said and uh, what some of the appellate decisions have said? You know, why don't I throw it open first to to uh, to Tom? You know. Is materiality a reasonable person standard after Escobar? Is it subjective? What is it? I think that the way the courts have broken out materiality post Escobar has been um, has not been consistent. So I think it depends on which circuit you're in. Some courts say um, when you look at materiality, you look at it from the perspective of well, what did the government do after it was aware? Um, but even Escobar on remand, the court said, well, we're only going to focus on what the government did at the time of the claim being submitted. So I think there's some inconsistency about how materiality is going to be considered. That's my, my view. Yeah. Rich, what do you think? What's your view? Uh, I know you're not speaking on behalf of the entire Department <laughs> of Justice, uh, but thank you. The, your the, personal view here. Yeah. The, I don't represent or my what I'm going to say here is not uh, to be imputed to all of my thousands of colleagues in the Department of Justice. These are my own views. Um, my sense, based on, so we're about one year in, a little bit more uh, than one year into the Escobar decision. And uh, there has been a significant number of cases. Uh, some of these cases had already been pending and before circuit courts and then uh, they went back to the circuits, uh, as, as Chris was outlining. Uh, but uh, suffice it to say, I agree with Tom uh, that um, you know you could you can start building a heat map, uh, and and in different circuits, and maybe even still within circuits, um, you're getting different perspectives. As as far as the government is concerned, uh, so I'm, I am going to take the party line here. Uh, the statute has a provision. Uh, it specifically defines materiality as having a natural tendency to influence the decision of the government uh, employee in question or the government generally. Uh, it's a perfectly fine definition. If you take a textual approach to interpreting statutes as a lot of jurists do, um, arguably that should be the end of it. But the Supreme Court basically disagreed with that. Um, and uh, it accepted the definition, but then it went further uh, and it elaborated and looked to common law. Um, and the, uh, I, the, the short answer is that it, the court has given us uh, two different uh, ways of looking at materiality. Uh, one is the reasonable man standard. And that's always very clear, right, what the, <laughs> what that, what the implications of that standard are. Uh, and then it's the other is where the, the prospective defendant uh, has information or an understanding of what the government considers to be important, to be material. Um, and uh, I, I think that this will be a recipe for uh, many, many, many diverse uh, decisions and holdings uh, and, and rationales uh, for the foreseeable future. Rob, what's your what's your view? I mean, do you think that the Supreme Court, uh, you know, dialed back materiality or you know raised the standard too high? I I think they um, it's not clear what the standard is that they laid down. I think what they did is they reoriented the focus of these cases so that um, they reoriented it so that from the beginning the court can focus and should focus on this question of materiality. Um, prior to that. 
I think courts were focusing on technicalities to get rid of cases that they suspected were weak cases or to keep cases going that they suspected had something there. I mean, one of the ironies of the False Claims Act is that you have the liability for treble damages and civil penalties, which is far worse from the defendant's standpoint than liability for a regulatory sanction. And yet, you have uh, private citizens, relators, who I represent, in the, in the uh, position to bring cases, whether or not the government actually wants to pursue those cases, so that you have whistleblowers in these, in, often in declined cases, going forward with cases where the government not only has decided not to intervene in the case on behalf of the government under the False Claims Act, but the government, knowing of the alleged violations, has done nothing on the regulatory front so that you have a whistleblower pursuing these, you know, the, the sledgehammer approach when the government did not even bother to raise its fly swatter. You know, so I think that's, that's where courts have been concerned. And I will say, backtracking, when the court took cert in this case, Scalia was part of the group that voted to take cert, we assume. He, he was alive at the time they voted to take cert. He passed away before the oral argument. And when cert was granted, a lot of us in the bar anticipated that this would come down 5-4 in favor of the defendant, this case. Um, and the reason we thought that is it came up at the same time as another case involving a company called Triple Can Canopy, which was a defense fraud case involving guards who literally could not shoot straight, um, and the company falsified their marksmanship records to make it look like they passed them when that was a requirement under the contract. So, I mean, it was, it was just a, an outrageous case. And the fact that the government, and the government was hoping they would take certain that, as opposed to uh, Escobar, and the fact that the Supreme Court decided to take Escobar and punt triple canopy down the road was a very ominous sign. And then Scalia passed away, and all of a sudden, over the, next, the rest of that term, the Supreme Court um, was much more in a consensus building mode. And so when this case was actually argued, you ended up with an eight nothing decision as opposed to a 5-4 decision one way or the other. Um, so th with that context, I actually think that you not only have the two standards that, that we've talked about here, the, the reasonable person standard and the, well, even if the government is unreasonable, as long as the defendant knows that they're unreasonable and that this matters to the unreasonable person, then that can be a, a basis for liability. Then what they did was followed with all these examples of situations where this kind of situation would be evidence of materiality, this other kind of situation would be evidence of lack of materiality or strong evidence. Um, you're disqualified from even going forward with the case if it's a trivial violation, but of course that would be the opposite of material. Um, and so you have on the one hand the reasonable man uh, objective standard and the unreasonable person but with the knowledge that they're unreasonable standard which the Supreme Court took from the restatement of contracts and the restatement of torts and then on top of that you have all these examples which indicate that we're not really interested in objective uh, standards here we're interested in what actually happened after the fact how did the government actually treat this claim. And so um, it's very hard to know, except for one thing, is that with the exception of the, the blanket statement that we're not interested in trivial, uh, trivial violations, um, the Supreme Court has made it so fact specific that they've given the district courts leeway to apply it however they really choose, depending on how the case smells to them. So I think in now with the benefit of a year's um, case law, I think one of the things that's come out is that the courts do feel that the government intervention decision is significant because after all, 
the government uh, representative, the Department of Justice, saying that we want to pursue the case is a pretty clear indication that somebody in the government cares about what happened. Um, second, as far as the situation where uh, the defendant claims that the government kept paying the claims um, and therefore that should be considered evidence of lack of materiality, I think courts have been sensitive to the nuance there. The fact that you have situations, for example, where there's a battlefield procurement and the government has to keep procuring a gun that shoots half as well as it's supposed to because they have no other guns in the procurement pipeline. And so the fact that they keep procuring the gun knowing that it's got problems does not mean that they should be denied the ability to get their damages through a, for a knowing false claim. Or in the case of a drug, a drug might be uh, defective in a sense or off-label um, and there might be harm to patients, but there might not be anything else available. So you can't simply tell the Medicare population of the United States or Medicaid population, you cannot have this drug. Um, and at the same time, there may be False Claims Act damages. Or nursing homes, you might not want to shut down a nursing home chain and put everyone, else, uh, uh, everyone there out on the street um, because you know that they're falsifying uh, certain categories for reimbursement. And so there, there's a lot of sensitivity in there. And so then it comes down to when do you apply these standards? And I think depending on the fact pattern, you're gonna see some courts saying, we're comfortable that this fact pattern as alleged is just so deficient, we're gonna throw it out at the pleading stage. You're gonna find, I think most courts where there's a, um, a, a half, I want to say half decently pleaded complaint, most courts are going to kick that down until after discovery, I think. Tom, what are your thoughts in terms of, um, you know, sort of the who, the who, what, where of disclosure, you know, in terms of government knowledge, you know, who, who it's disclosed to, what, what is disclosed, okay. when it's disclosed? I, I think w what's interesting in looking at the cases, you know, so, um, Rob referenced F FDA approval, right? And so there's a case post Escobar that says FDA approval is relevant and if FDA is misled, then that claim should not, should be, uh, that fact pattern should allow someone to allege a False Claims Act case. There's another case that says the FDA is not the paying entity. So the FDA's knowledge or whatever the FDA did is sort of irrelevant. So, because they're not the ones who are accepting, who are making the payment. So I think- um, And then there's a third case. And then there's a third right. case, right? right. So I, I think, who knows? I think it goes back to what Rob was saying. I think if the fact pattern is one, I don't want to suggest that all courts are outcome determinative, but, but if there's a bad fact pattern, if people are being harmed, I believe, Courts are going to look at those various factors. Who, who knew, such as the FDA, uh, versus was it the person who, who was making the payment knew? And I think that's where the courts are going to ultimately end up based on the whether the fact pattern is sort of a um, sounds in fraud uh, uh, in a way that's different from, well, you know, we have this floating platform that people have analyzed, and the floating platform's fine. The Department of Interior's looked at the platform. They said it's fine. No one's done anything with it. No one's being harmed. You know, that case isn't going to survive. And interesting, you, you mentioned courts have pointed to the decision of the government to intervene. In some cases, they point to that, the government's intervention decision, as evidence of materiality. In some cases, they say the government didn't intervene, therefore it can't be material. But I think the government's position, Rich, is that whether you intervene or not, it's not really relevant to the court's determination. And that's certainly our position for the relators. <laughs> well, Rich, what is, what is the government's position? Uh, the, the or at least your personal position. <laughs> First, I want to get back to where you started, Chris, when you were talking about that mule that 
that was being sold over and over and over to the government. Right. Um, the um, the thing that um, I, I, I think the the question uh, on uh, that 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 I find as I, I'm listening to all this that I find interesting, and forgive me if I'm I'm chain, refocusing this a little bit, um, is that um, there's a, a presumption that you've you've got a, a government that, and no one here is from the government. Is that a fair assumption? Has anyone here ever worked for the government? So if you've worked for the government, you know that there isn't really one government. Um, and there isn't just one, uh, you know, uh, one monolithic approach to, to dealing with uh, companies uh, that are uh, submitting claims to the government. And uh, as, I, as I sit here, I think about uh, the many cases where uh, I've, I've seen uh, that uh, there are different views within the government. Now, this is the kind of thing that defendants will often look to. They'll say, well, you know, if, if you've got one guy who's saying one thing and another guy who's saying something else, uh, that means that the government doesn't have a, a view or position on this, and then how can the defendant be committing fraud? Um, and I, I think it's more complicated than that. I think that uh, when we're talking about the materiality analysis, which is one of the bigger things to come out of Escobar, I think, um, I mean, falsity and implied certification is, is a critical component, obviously, of the decision, but materiality uh, seems to be where a lot of the cases have been, been going. And I think that when you're looking at the materiality question, uh, y you need to know a lot of information. Uh, you need to know uh, who in the government uh, was aware of what. Um, I think that as I think about this knowledge question, uh, which is also a critical component of, of a number of the materiality-based decisions, uh, I've always looked at the question of material of, of knowledge of being one where did the government acquiesce? Was there kind of an effective modification of the contract or of the programmatic requirements? Uh, and who were the players there? And from my perspective, when I see a case that, let's say, Rob files or that Tom is defending, uh, and Chris will be, will hypothesize as the neutral arbiter of all this, um, I, I think of uh, the first thing I do is try to figure out what government witness will stand behind the notion that a claim that was submitted to the government was false. Uh, but also that it mattered, that it was false, and, and, and that it concerned something that mattered. And I'm looking for that witness. And uh, if I don't have that witness, then there's no case. And that's how I look at it. Um, it's funny that you say that because just, you know, very few of these things go to trial. But, but having, having been in a trial, you know, the, the thing we were searching for, and the government had intervened, but we were a team, was where's our, who is our victim? You know, we were not going to go into trial without having somebody that we could put up as a victim. Now, it turned out that our victim um, at the, the entity then known as HICFA, now known as CMS, was pretty weak. Um, so we were afraid to put that person up, but we then, we, it was a bench trial, so we ended up putting up deposition excerpts. And interestingly, from our perspective, the defendant was equally afraid of trying to put up that witness. So they were fine with that whole thing. So I think we got away with it. Um, I mean, we ended up doing fine at trial. And I think we got away with the fact that we didn't have to um, fully expose the weakness of our witness. But that's, that is the, a main concern. I mean, look at Escobar, right? I mean, the, the way it came out, I mean, the victim obviously was Medicaid. The federal government is who the victim is, but or Massachusetts Medicaid, or Medicaid really. right? right. So, Mass Medicaid, right. So, so there, but but there's a real live person who yes. who suffered adverse consequences as a result of the actions that were going on. So having a real live victim, not just the government as the government as a victim, I think really helps and and I think frames some of these issues that are coming out in the courts of appeal. And, and Medicaid there did take regulatory action they actually did step in and do something so that they were a, a 
victim who had shown that they were victimized, that they believed they were victimized. I was going to add one thing. When you talked about the two different FDA cases, the third one is um, also one of the two, I think, was out of the First Circuit. Right. D'Agostino. And, yeah. and D'Agostino was the third right. one. So D'Agostino, where it involved a medical device, right? That's right. And, and the medical device had been on the market, and um, someone brought a Quitom case, and the government declined to intervene. And it had been kicking around on the court's docket for six and a half years when it got to the Court of Appeals for, I think, maybe the second time, but at least this time. And um, the court said, you know, the FDA has for a long time now known full well about the problem that's alleged here. And they have chosen to do absolutely nothing from a regulatory standpoint. And you, plaintiff, are asking us, the court, to allow you to put this decision in the hands of six jurors in Massachusetts um, and let them make a decision to override the FDA's decision, which is an agency which has the availability of all these experts and panels that can evaluate the efficacy of this medical device. And we're simply not going to do that. And even that case, if I remember correctly, wasn't entirely based on materiality. It was also a causation issue as well. Mm -hmm. That's um, right. And so, you know, I think even there, the First Circuit felt that, you know, there wasn't enough to completely rule just on materiality and just kind of did it on both grounds. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Rich, getting back to you, you know, th this does raise a question. I mean, when, when the Department of Justice intervenes in a case or, or when it doesn't, but it's had a chance to consider the allegations, should that be some uh, evidence of materiality the government has considered the allegations and made a determination or at least an initial determination and I understand again not speaking officially no, but no, no. what's and, your view on that and, and Chris thank you for pointing out that I dodged your question earlier <laughs> um, <laughs> I was yeah, trying to do it gently but yeah but so uh, what I was suggesting uh, but I will answer the question because it's a fair question um, uh, and, and I think that Rob is right that, I mean, certainly right that courts are, you know, beginning to, and always have, let's face it, looked at the question of whether the government has declined to intervene as being, or looking at the fact that the government has declined to intervene as being somehow um, a, an indication that the government, whose statute the False Claims Act is, uh, doesn't think there's a case. Um, and the reason why I went off on that long thing about uh, trying to find a government witness is that, um, as, as you folks know who, who practiced in this area, the government is actually obligated when Rob or any of the other folks um, in the Quitam Bar have filed a case, the government is obligated to investigate the case. Uh, and in fact, it's something that is expected not just within the Department of Justice, but also uh, within uh, the Congress and particularly the Senate and one senator in particular. Uh, so we do that, uh, and we look for that. I look for that witness uh, who will, uh, who hopefully can actually take the stand. I'm not just putting it in by deposition and get behind a case. Where we decide to decline, there can be a number of reasons why the government declines. Um, it could be uh, for uh, the reason that uh, it's a close case uh, and uh, the amount of work uh, that would go into uh, determining uh, the, the full strength of the case would be extraordinary. And if you throw in the, pos the prospect that there might not be a lot of dollars that can be recovered by the government or that the government has been defrauded out of, uh, we may decide to decline for that reason. Um, uh, it's, there's also something else, uh, and, and uh, everyone uh, on the panel can address this. Uh, there's an increasing number, as Chris was pointing out, of, of QUITAM cases, of, of cases that are filed pursuant to the QUITAM provisions. By the way, the government can file its own case without there being a QUITAM case, but a lot of the cases have, have you know, for years now have been started by QUITAM relators. Um, the courts uh, in, in a number of the circuits and have, have uh, you know, been putting their, their foot down uh, and, uh, and giving the government increasingly less time to make its intervention determination. 
Um, and as you can imagine, uh, when, when someone like Rob, who's actually vetted a case, uh, comes to the government with a, with a complaint, uh, someone of Rob's caliber is, is, it can be expected to give us a, a, a good work product. That's not always the case. Um, we uh, find ourselves sometimes looking at three paste pieces of paper uh, that, that purport to lay out a multi-billion dollar fraud um, and, uh, and, you know, hypothetically, the relator and the relator's counsel is saying, good luck, uh, make us a lot of money. Um, forgive me for being so cynical, but that's some, some of the, we see some of that. Uh, we also see the other side of the spectrum, uh, wonderful cases, well pled, disclosing awful frauds that the government just wasn't aware of. The point, though, is we're flooded with these cases these days. Um, folks who uh, were filing quitam cases uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago, Rob among them, uh, you, you know, have, have, got a, have long had a sense of what's a good case and what's not. Um, but there are other folks who are getting into the business of filing, and I, I apologize if some of you are, are newly getting into uh, this practice area on behalf of relators, and that's great. Um, but, but, uh, but there are some folks who just don't quite understand uh, what is material to the government, um, or what is actually a false claim, uh, or how a government program really works. Um, and perhaps they can be forgiven for that. Uh, but nonetheless, when we get these things, uh, and a lot of them, uh, we have increasingly less time from the courts. The statute provides for 60 days, which is not a lot of time to figure out whether there's been a multi-billion dollar fraud perpetrated against the government. Um, and as Rob pointed out, some of these cases drag on for years as a result. Because when we get it, it's square one, it's day one. We knew nothing about it, as opposed to uh, other cases where behind the scenes with the FBI or HHS OIG, uh, the Defense Criminal Investigative Service, we've been working up a case. Uh, and folks and the court certainly don't see the years that went behind the manufacture of that case. Cretam cases, it's all out there in the open for the court to see. Uh, so we sometimes find ourselves declining because we, although we've made efforts and we've certainly discharged our responsibility under the statute, our view is to, to investigate the case, um, it's just going to take us a long time to get to the point where we understand everything and we know with certainty whether there's a case. Um, we do our best. I think we get it right most of the time, um, but not always. And, and there certainly have been quitam cases that, that relators uh, took uh, to great result, uh, huge judgments um, after the government declined. And frankly, that should tell courts too that every once in a while, the government's declination decision is not truly indicative of whether there is materiality. Uh, because there have been those cases that have gone to successful result after the government declined.